Hello, I'm Karen Arante here at the Town Hall in Cohasset, Massachusetts for Living Histories. And today I'm with Jackie Dormitzer, who is the Cohasset archivist for all of the historical records of town here that are in, in, this, in vault. this vault well, that we're sitting in right now, which is pretty amazing. So I have a few photographs of the town hall from, now I don't have the very original photograph of the town hall, but I do have one here of um, the town hall in 1889. Uh, this is um, the town meeting in March 2nd of 1889 of all of the men waiting to head in for the town meeting. And here we have another one in the 20s um, which is, they renovated this building in 18, uh, 1928, I believe, and then they put the addition that we are all familiar with um, in uh, 1987, uh, tearing down this home here on the, the, the right here that you see, which is where the parking lot is now. So can you tell us a little more about the, where you, where you are? archiving the t historical records. This is part of the addition that was built in 1988, I, I believe. And uh, prior to this, well, first of all, when the bicentennial, the Cohasset bicentennial and the na national bicentennials occurred, the records on Cohasset were scattered around town hall. They weren't consolidated at all. So uh, finally, they decided all of these, the records should be brought together and put in a safe place, so they built a, a vault in the, t in the high school for a while. Wow. But that was not climate controlled and so forth. So that when this addition was built, they, they also included this vault, although it didn't have these, this nice shelf system, it was more of the traditional shelf system. So then, David Wadsworth, who was appointed uh, town archivist in, I believe it was 1979, organized everything. He did a tremendous amount of work. When I came on board in 2014, just a couple of years ago, however, yeah. all the, the records were again here and there in the vault because they took out the old shelving, put this in, quickly removed all the all the records and then quickly put them back almost anywhere. So when I entered this vault, I saw things on the floor, um, you know, s separated, uh, the, their town accountants uh, material, some was here, some was there. So I had to decide how I wanted to organize all of this. And um, I also, created an inventory. Uh, David did have one, but he had a, a number system, so and only he knew where things were. So I decided I would label things with first the department, like the treasurers, or the collectors, the uh, accountants, and so forth, and put all the books that belong to one department in one general area. And then I included on the label the dates and so forth. And then in this book here, where to find it, I, I made an inventory and just said where the, um, the books could be found, what bay, what case, and what shelf. So now anyone can come down here and find a book. They could just look it up in here if they know what department right, that they were looking for. to. So now, can you tell us how you got to Cohasset and when you got to Cohasset? That's yeah. to, 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 to where we are. from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I came to Cohasset with my husband and two little children in 1967. Um, when Ralph and I were first married, we lived in Brookline and we had Philip, uh, we were married in 62, we had Philip in 63 and Paul in 65 <laughs> and our little apartment was getting very tight. So Ralph's parents, owned a house and, and quite a bit of property on South Main Street in Cohasset. So we bought some of their property that was on South Main Street and we built a house there in 67. And uh, almost right away we got involved at St. Anthony's Church. Um, this was a 
the time a little bit after Vatican II when the um, local parishes were given more authority to create a parish council to help the priests and so forth. So uh, Ralph was on the steering committee I think in 1969 and we became involved in the first <coughs> religious education program that was run by the parish council and not the, uh, the priest and his assistant. So that's how we we got start. We got involved almost right away, and that was in, when Father Brennan town. was there. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then after that, we we just kind of kept on going. Um, I'm from Chicago, and you're just a very small fish in a big pond there. But here in a small town, um, you can make more of an impact. Mm. So you know, we once we started, we just. Uh, volunteered for other things and have kept up our involvement in the town ever since. Yes. So now after your involvement with the church, then you became involved with the town politics or the town de uh, town hall at least. Well, yeah, let's see. I, I did so many things. We after that I became a the actually the chairman of the Friends of the Cohasset Library, or the Paul oh. Pratt Memorial Library. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a, an easy segue from church to library, right. same sort of thing. And then after that, um, I I was asked to I was appointed to the Cohasset Advisory Board, uh -huh. um, and that that was a wonderful experience because in those days um, the advisory committee cre really was in charge of, of creating the budget with the help of the town accountant. And we were divided up into pairs, and we went to various town departments and discussed their budget with them. And that way, I got to get to know many, many town department heads, and uh, to understand the workings of the town. So that was really a, that was a wonderful experience. So now, what years were you involved with the the, the advisory board? From 1981 to 1986. Oh, yeah. That was a busy time. That was a very busy time. A lot um, happened in that period. Prop two and a half, first of all, uh, began in 80 or 81. And that was very difficult for the town because it meant the taxes were capped at two and a half percent. And all the town departments had to cut their budgets, and that was, which is painful you know, for anyone. So um, we had a very good chairman, Jean Cotton, who, who worked with the town accountant, and she was very, very objective, and um, she helped, she didn't sort of have a, a flat uh, reduction for every department. She, she sort of gave consideration to the needs of each department and tried to get them to reduce as much as they could without um, causing t you know too much harm because the workings of Prop Two and a Half was all brand new for everybody in the state. Well, it was that's right because the, the taxes had gone way up. Massachusetts was called Taxachusetts right, because right. Of, of of the high taxes, and a citizens group in in Massachusetts got together to um, to sort Pull of tax this very high. Get back back into the. Right. Uh, so that that so what else during that time frame what was challenging in the in in that well not not for me so much but for the town accountant um, the town hall became computerized oh <laughs> and, that, and that was that, that because nobody really had computers in those days I mean not not to a great extent so they had to learn and the town accountant struggled with that but we he got called in a, uh, some, a couple in Cohasset who were in the industry and so they helped him. But that was, that was very difficult. It turned out to be a very good thing though, obviously, right. afterwards, but right. that was a big transition. Um, there, the uh, town, the Board of Selectmen increased from three to five members to... And how did that, how did that come about? What, well, what a, th a three-person board was kind of, um, oh, they didn't have too much oversight, you know, people were not um, 
it was a little bit more political, I suppose. They they made their decisions, and it wasn't we didn't have the open meeting law and so forth. Oh, but then the open meeting law came in, and uh, the town just they well the there was a charter commission who who also advocated to increase the number of selectmen from three to five to get greater representation and to encourage more townspeople to to run for the office. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, people stayed on the Board of Selectment for, for many, many, many years, but this way, you know, a, a businessman who had to commute to Boston might be willing to devote three years on the Board of Selectment. Mm -hmm. So you got a little bit more expertise that way. It became a little bit more professional mm. when it changed from three to five. And then the, uh, the quorum uh, was reduced from 200 to 100 at town meeting. And um, that's because sometimes town meeting was delayed for, a, for hours because we, Waiting we couldn't for get 200 people to come. Yeah. So it made it much easier, m much more efficient. But it also meant that people could pack it if they had a special interest <laughs> that they wanted to promote with 51 people, and, and then they often would just leave right afterwards. So it was a mixed blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then, then you were involved with the Art Center. Uh, uh, yes, I was asked to be on the board of directors, and uh, that was a time when um, they transitioned from the old building which is on Ripley Road, which is the, the Flatiron Building. Which is right across from the post office. That's right. And yeah. they, then uh, there was Tantillo's Auto Body Shop on the corner of um, Ripley Road and Brook Street, uh, no, on uh, Depot Court. Mm -hmm. So they, that was torn down and the new art center was built on that spot. And it also happened to be the original location of the Cohasset uh, railroad station. Oh, too, a long time ago, before it was Tantillo's. Yeah. <laughs> mm. So get mm -hmm. back into use again mm -hmm. for that. Um, so now, uh, so was it, did this segue into the Renaissance? Um, no, that really wasn't. I mean, the Village Renaissance was Philip Smith's idea. Philip at that time had a um, an interior decoration decorating shop in downtown Cohasset and in this time the the, uh, the down to the village looked kind of seedy uh, people really weren't maintaining things there were tattered awnings um, uh, this empty space between Tedeschi's and French memories was you know it, it sort of attracted um, loiterers, and it, it was not very attractive. So Philip decided that 1990 should be the year of Cohasset's Renaissance, and, yeah. and uh, I went to a meeting that he held just for anyone to, to, to come, and um, I volunteered to help him. And another woman, Beth Christoffel, also wanted to help. So the two of us um, formed a grassroots committee to beautify downtown and to try to um, encourage the merchants to maybe repair their awnings and, and take a little bit better care of, of the, the premises. And pe we asked people for ideas on what, what could we do to make the village more attractive. And I think it was Noel Ripley came up with the idea of, res of making a replica of the old town pump which had originally stood right outside where Cohasset Hardware was at, at the time. Mm -hmm. So we thought that was a great idea and um, we, hi we asked Char Charlie Butman, who was a woodworker, um, if, if he would make the replica of the pump. And uh, Jim Sandell yeah. um, helped with that, the landscaping around it and with not so much the design of the pump. We actually, there was a, an, another architect, um, Ben Blake, who I think did the original design for the pump and, and Charlie added his own features to it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but Jim did a tremendous amount just to, to 
bring the, um, what would we call it, a plaza, out into the street a bit more and to have brick and cobblestone and uh, a couple of planters. So that was our, the first big project. Now, mm -hmm. to bring out the cobblestone, um, w that which was also donated uh, uh, yeah. labor for that, right. um, but that was that was a two-way street then to go down Elm Street. Well, that's r and people were were concerned. Yeah, <laughs> and and however, um, Jim is a does urban planning, mm -hmm. and he realized that by bringing the the uh, corner out a little bit people would actually have a better view down Elm Street and thus avoid oncoming traffic better than they could previously so it actually turned out to be a benefit rather than um, a detriment to traffic oh so, but it is it is a two-way two way, yeah. yeah it, is it two was way. proposed to be a one-way yeah, they, they but, go, but no, that, that just was a no-go yeah no, yeah no so every so the pump gets shut down in the winter. It does. So it doesn't yeah, get frozen. The water department turns the water off. Yes. In the winter, and then it turns it back on in the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was a there's a trough there. Yeah, there so. is there there is a trough uh, and a basin. Um, it's modeled after the original one. Actually, that that the basin exists in someone's on someone's private property, but he was not willing to give it up. So. We we did go to a uh, a, a stone uh, like a quarry, mm. and the owner had part of a, a steeple of an of a church in New Hampshire that looked like a basin. So we we bought that very inexpensively and had it scooped out a little bit so it became more of a basin with a, a drain hole in it so the water could flow into the uh, pipe underneath. Oh, <laughs> so it looks, so it's, it's, it looks, it's it looks really pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it really does look yeah. great. Yeah. So now you, um, so now you, you, so your first effort was the trough. Yeah, uh, it the, was the, the pump. pump. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a very big deal, and many townspeople were involved in that project actually and contributed to it. Um, the second project was the walkway between what was then Cards and Shards, is now Atlantic Bagel. Okay, and um, and the uh, the gas station, and that was a very disreputable. Like people were afraid to walk through there at night, so we um, cleaned it cleaned it up. We removed all the old the bamboo grass, which is invasive, and planted uh, privet, and put in some nice posts uh, instead of this falling down fence that they had on one side of the walkway and repaved the, the walkway and uh, turned that into a, a, a nice area. Yes, yes, it's very nice. Yeah. We'll, sh we'll show pictures mm -hmm. of that. Okay. On. So, so now we've got one side of the street, then yeah, we've got, got the walkway, yeah. and then you went on to we, the uh, that empty lot between no, um, that's where the drugstore burned that's, down. That's right. right. And that was empty for many, many years. <coughs> and um, so, uh, again, Philip was the one who said, well, you should make a pocket park out of that. And we loved the, the idea of a pocket park. <laughs> that just sounded nice. So, uh, we uh, actually, the high school pa had painted a mural on, on a, a large uh, wall that was part of um, the building where Tedeschi's now is. And we got them to complete, to, that was this spring, spring. Um, mural, mm -hmm. and they then did the other seasons. <laughs> and, yeah, the yeah. and it looks fun, and then it was eventually repaint, the, the uh, background was repainted and um, there was a little vandalism. Now there's just then the the bank actually uh, Pilgrim Co-op Bank, which owned the building, painted over the whole thing so it looked clean and nice again. And then um, an another high school art group painted the the current um, mural that's that's there. So that was uh, the the last big project that we did. Um, after that we. Help the merchants 
plant flowers. Uh, we just felt that would look nice, so we would go out and buy flowers, which they would pay us for, and we would plant the flowers for them. And at the beginning, we also, I think, uh, encouraged them to buy hanging baskets of, of flowers, but somehow, you know, that some did it and some didn't. But, mm -hmm. but it, they're all doing it on their own now, and of course, that was many years ago. And the so, what what year? What do you think was the Pocket Park put together? I can tell you exactly. Yeah, um, just so that we yeah. have an idea of. It's called Ship Cove Park, and it was 1995. So okay. that's um, well because no, well, I had read that Ship Co that Elm Street section used to be called Ship Cove Lane that, yes. because it used to be the well it the, is still the, a road yeah, it goes right. down to the cove right. but so they they changed the name to Elm Street so that so wow that was quite a while ago then yeah. all these yeah. and I I should mention too Ann Whalen who was a long time resident of Cohasset helped a lot she. She worked very well with the merchant. She, in fact, had some experience in retail herself. So she would <laughs> very nicely persuade the, um, the merchants to maybe pick up the litter outside their shops mm -hmm. and, and um, to, to plant the flower, to allow us to plant their flowers and, and, and all that. So it was a, a very good team, but Beth moved away to Oklahoma and um, and uh, also moved moved out of town, and so we and we had done our job. I think the merchants now are doing a very good job. The downtown looks wonderful. Yeah. And um, I, we we were no longer necessary. Well, right. we did a wonderful yeah. job. It really is mm -hmm. was really quite spectacular when that park got all cleaned up mm -hmm. because it was really quite a mess. So now after oh, after. The Renaissance, mm -hmm. which is still around. I mean, that that organization is still. No, I I have sunsetted it. Oh, you did? Yeah, because um, I did try to get some younger women to take over, but they're just so busy. You know, they have little children and they're working, and it it was just very hard to get people to to take it over. Plus, it wasn't as necessary. I I feel that the the merchants now are, are taking care of their properties and it looks pretty good. Yeah. And um, and and maybe in you know some year another group will say you know this place looks a little seedy maybe we should do something. Well now when is our next big town party? <laughs> That's in 2020. Okay. Yeah. So 2020. It's going to be a. 250th anniversary of Cohasset. Okay. And that the uh, historical commission and the selectmen are going to, uh, the selectmen will be naming a committee to organize that. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we'll be spruced up, all spruced up. That's that. true. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So now, can you tell me your next involvement? Which you, you're always keeping yeah. busy. You're yeah. always doing <laughs> something. Then after that. Um, in 1998, I was asked to write the third narrative history of Cohasset from 1950 to 2000, and that was a major undertaking. Um, so that kept me busy for, for several years, and there were offshoots of that too. But um, that was a, a very big deal because the last book had been published, uh, well, in 1956, but it covered from 1898 to 1950, and nothing had been written since. So I think this has begun a tradition now of every 50 years, a new narrative history of Cohasset will be written, which makes sense. I mean, can, can you sentence. show us the book that you wrote? Now, was this your first um, book of history like this? Yeah, it was my first history book. I had had many years of experience as a freelance copy editor for uh, college textbook companies and uh, sort of enrichment. You know, if, if you take a, a, cl a class in history, you have your history text, but the professor might also assign you some smaller books, mm -hmm. which are the enrichment books. So I um, actually right down the street from where we lived, a small company opened called Duxbury Press. And I just walked down there and walked in as they were unpacking, you know, they just had opened. And I said, uh, do you need any help? And I was hired right away as an assistant um, production manager or something yeah. like that. 
and then later on I became a copy editor for them. Oh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So, so this book you came. What what other books did you pull out after the this this book? Well, this book involved doing a, a lot of research um, at the Situate Library in because Cohasset really didn't have a great deal on the fifties and sixties. So, Situate had the uh, a couple of newspapers, uh, South Shore News and Situate Herald, I believe, which also contained news on Cohasset. So I, I looked at their microfilm, and I discovered art, other articles in these old newspapers that had to do with the older history of Cohasset. I said, oh, that's really interesting. I think I'll just um, make a copy of this and read it some other time. So I just kept you know, making copies of all these old articles. And then it occurred to me that you know if I hadn't stumbled upon these, no one would ever know they existed. So I said, well, you know, maybe I should collect as many interesting articles as I can find and publish them in an anthology, which is what I did. And I have actually, it turned out to be two anthologies. The, uh, the first one that was a treasury of Cohasset history. And that has articles written by many other people, but mostly actually David Wadsworth. Oh, and he was he was um, yeah he he was the historian for the historical society and he would write articles for their newsletter, but they were never you know once consolidated they never consolidated and once they people had read them they put put it away and that would be that so I thought well you know his the more interesting of his articles really should be published so that people can enjoy them and read them. So many are in here, and then this I tried to follow Cohasset history, you know, from period to period. But there were some kind of idiosyncratic articles that didn't fit into any particular pigeonhole, and that's in Savor of Salt, which is really it's it's kind of maybe more of a fun book in a way. It has um, some unusual books, but uh, unusual articles, but also some articles that reflect. The ones in here, but it's just a maybe a different author, and I I just felt you know these should be preserved. They shouldn't just be put away in in some archive, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and never seen again. Yeah. So anyway, that's the origin of these two books. And then after that, um, I thought, well, you know, Cohasset doesn't have a guidebook, and I was very much now aware of of all the historical places in Cohasset. And um, even I didn't know that much about them, not enough to explain it to a visitor. So I said, well, maybe I should put together something that could be very handy for people who have guests who want to show them around the town. So I, I wrote that Exploring Historic Cohasset, which is a guidebook. And instead of, I didn't, I wanted I wanted it to be very practical and easy, so instead of writing paragraphs, I just had bullet points. And um, you yeah, know, that's that's fine. Um, someday, you know, someone might want it to write another guidebook that has more narrative to it. Yeah. But I thought, you know, this is just if you're walking around, you don't want to spend a lot of time in reading concise things. history, which it's is a, yeah, right. That, yeah. That, and at the back of the book, there is a concise history of, of Cohasset, actually taken from the introductions to the historical periods oh. in, in this book. But that gives you Cohasset history in a nutshell. Great. Right. And then finally, um, I decided I'll do one more book. And I, I've always been interest, sort of fascinated by the rock formations in Cohasset, and also by the, by the Indians who lived in this area. So I undertook this, this the origins of Cohasset. And this is really maybe my most original book in terms of it, it's, it was my idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so um, it's just divided into two parts, uh, a, a geological portion, and I, I got quite a bit of help in, in the early part, which was very, which was technical about plate tectonics from a, um, a geophysicist who lived in Hull. And then um, the last part, Cohasset has a lot of artifacts from the in from the uh, period of 
of Indian occupation in, in Cohasset. And uh, I, I just uh, gathered as much information as I could from Bigelow and then from uh, the Robbins Museum in Middleborough, for example, has a lot on the, the different periods of time in which Indians lived in this region. So then I put together this small book, but um, it has, I, th I think it's just a, an interesting, now is that history. Uh, does this book also include the quarrying that was in Cohasset? No, it doesn't. Okay. No, it doesn't do that. It just, um, it's, it's really mainly on the formation of the granite okay. and, and, yeah. and the glacial, um, you know, the Drumlin Hills and the glacial erratics and so forth that are, are around. Yeah. Wow, very, very yeah. interesting. So, so that's it. So in your next book? Well, <laughs> well I don't know. I, I think maybe there might be some writing opportunities for this um, 250th anniversary of, of Cohasset. Who kno I don't, I really don't know. It's yeah. We're just sort of getting a lot of ideas and um, I think there is going to be a, a video, which I think Don would be involved in. <laughs> but let but him that, know. That'll be something different. I mean, it's probably a little more modern to have uh, a video rather than a book, but we'll see. Yeah. They're, they're oh, you can have both. You can have you know, both. Multimedia you today, both. you know. That's right. Yeah. Now, so, now, after writing all these books, actually before finishing all these books, it, it was like a, 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 a really understood segue Well, how you ended up here at Town well, Archivist. Well, after I'd, I'd written my last book, and actually, um, very sadly, um, Wig Pearson had died, and he was the chairman of the Committee on Town History that shepherded the narrative history of Cohasset and the first anthology. And Jim Hamilton, who took over after him, also died. And de, uh, de, uh, uh, Dan Coughlin, who was the book designer, died. So, you know, all the principal people were gone, and I had written probably more than, um, you know, I, I knew you were going to. to yeah, uh, or knew you were going to. Yeah, on Cohasset. So I thought, you know, it's time to stop, but on the other hand, I, I, I've now gained a fair amount of information about Cohasset. And I, I'd like to keep my hand in it, so I decided to join the historical, the Cohasset Historical Commission. Mm -hmm. And the timing was good because they were also doing the Captain John Smith Day, and, and that was interesting to me because I wanted to um, bring in information about the Indians who lived here at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's been, uh, and then once I did that, um, David Wadsworth, who was a town archivist for 30 years, was in failing health, and he stepped down as archivist, and I uh, sort of offered to, to be the next one, mm -hmm. and I was appointed, and um, that was in a couple of years ago. So, now when you arrived, as you mentioned before, when you arrived in this vault that we're sitting yeah. in, right. It was not nearly. It was not. Not. No. It, it, it was it, not. It was really. So it was. I looked at it and I thought, how how am I going to deal with this? And so I sort of kept staring at the shelves and and then finally, you know, to, you know, I I did have a plan. I said, well, all you know, I, you, I see that there were these uh, payroll books here and they were kind of a little bit scattered, but. So I said, well, they should all be together, and then you should maybe have all the other uh, treasurer's records in, in one area, so anyone looking up records of interest to them will be able to find them easily. And then it just became clear that I had to do it by, by departments and have a way for people to find the books that they were interested in. And but it just certainly felt, the, felt the, together. the records that you had from the 1700s, 1800s, mm -hmm. In early 19, yeah. without the, the, everything was written. No, so does that? How do you? How do you have records for computer information here? Um, there was computerized. Was treasure. I don't. I don't. Oh, we have a handwritten rec. We have just all the permanent records. I mean, the early ones are handwritten. The 
later ones were typed and then computerized. So now where do the computerized ones go? Do they stay? Well, they're here. I mean, oh, they're, they're, these are... They're in yeah, these, right. whereas the handwritten ones are in the leather-bound books? Well, no, some, some are, some aren't. But actually, um, Carol St. Pierre, the town clerk, has a vault upstairs, and she has a lot of the old handwritten records, the uh, records of the uh, births, deaths, and marriages, which the old ones, which are all handwritten, um, early town reports. Um, so she has a great many of them. Mm -hmm. Down here, it's mostly um, well, sort of more business-like things like uh, accountant's records, assessor's records, and so forth. Right. And then the one book that you had shown me before, which well, I found very just an entree yeah. before you yeah. walk into the vault and I, because I was very fixated to, to <laughs> this <laughs> Pond Street Cemetery which I'm still doing my research oh, okay. on but my first stop was to come to the vault here yeah. and and find a book of deeds well, for yeah. purchased cemetery plots That's for Pond Street Cemetery right. which happens to be where the high school is now. That's that's right and of course um, that was in in very swampy land and what happened after a few that was the new that was the so-called new cemetery after um, the Central Cemetery and so everyone was excited to have this wonderful new cemetery but after a heavy rainfall the caskets would rise because of, of the rising groundwater, mm. so they had to eventually they had to transfer the caskets to uh, uh, Woodside Cemetery. Yeah, right. So, but th these are the the er, the deeds. Um, let's see. Okay, this is eighteen ninety seven. So it starts in 1896, but and these are obviously printed, and then uh, so, uh, some handwritten material is in here about where the, the lot is located and so forth. But you're you're welcome to look through this someday if you wish. Well, I I'm just curious where the people ended up in Woodside because yeah. we can't uh, find no, them in Woodside, can't. so. <laughs> We just look. I'm yeah, still, it's you, still, you, a pro you, it's still a project. We we may find them someday. Yes, they should be somewhere. Yeah. So this will give you an opportunity. Of, so we're going to take a walk through the through the vault, okay. and Jackie will point out a few of the the real very interesting. You, you were interested in really the old records, and as I say, Carol has many of them upstairs. But yeah. I do have one or two very interesting old records. Okay. Wonderful. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the um, the three score acre um, agreement, and this was a, a dispute between Situate and Hingham, which um, really was Cohas uh, Cohasset was a part of Hingham until 1717 when it became a separate precinct, and then 1770, which we're going to celebrate, when it became a separate district or town. So anyway. Uh, Hingham was a part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and Situ was part of Plymouth uh, Colony. And uh, they all want, both colonies wanted this, this, these three score acres which had a lot of very nutritious salt grass that they used to feed their cattle. And um, Cohasset believed that it, w it belonged to them and so they, they used it and so forth, but Situate kept taxing them for the land. And so they take this to court, and it just went on and on for 200 years. And finally it was resolved in Situate's favor. Oh. So, so that land does, it's, it's now, it's on the other side of the Gulf River, um, uh, on, off of Border Street. Okay. And there's Otis Avenue and Indian Trail, and there are lots of marshes in there. Yes, I believe that yes. a lot of that is part of the three square acres. But let okay. me, I can show you this ancient document. The document boxes are over here, and these document boxes contain a lot of very interesting information, many old records. And among the oldest are the three score acres. Um, 
agreement. And I can, it's right in here. And this is what the document box looks like. And you open it like this, and here it is. Very old, let's see, yeah. Well, I can just, three score acres, I can just see the, the writing right here. It's, it's mentioning three sco score acres of salt marsh land on the southward side of the, of the river. So anyway, and it, go, it goes on for some time. And records here, but anyway, it, it's from about 1686, <laughs> and, and that is very ancient. But there are even older records, I'll put this away later, the very oldest records that we have are the Hingham record copies of land grants dating from 1636. And let's see. And these are all, these are beautifully, I mean, the script was beautiful. People don't write like this anymore. Most people don't anyway. But this just tells you um, this, you know, that something like third lot in the first division given unto Thomas Andrews by the town, six acres of salt marsh at Coney Hassett. It is in, it is the third lot in the first division bounded with the meadow of Thomas, looks like Helt eastward, and with the town's land westward, and with the beach southward. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, I think it's just fa fascinating. You need to spend a little time with this, but it's a little hard to read, but it's, it's just you know, so historic and, and important because this is just the very beginning of of the land division in, in Cohasset. So. Here's an old school committee journal from 1849, and this is really kind of falling apart. But again, and it's hard to read. The, this, this script isn't quite as nice, but if I could read some of it. Mm. It's just talking about the, the pay for the teachers, and uh, it does have, okay, this is Cohasset, uh, August 3rd, 1891, gentlemen of the committee. Miss Annie Fox has presented to me a short list of, requ of requests which I hope the committee will consider. The first is that a coal stove should be placed in her school. The second, that the old double desks may be removed and some of the furniture that will be no longer needed because of the concentration of other scholars at the Osgood School may be placed in the Jerusalem schoolroom because the, the schools were divided in, in that time. Miss Fox is obliged to be her own janitor and is not quite satisfied with the compensation <laughs> now given for that work. She would like to receive enough for her work as, uh, as janitor to pay her traveling expenses to and from school. I mean, <laughs> this is before unions. <laughs> But anyways, it's just very, very interesting. It'd be fun to read, read more of this. But anyway, that's...